uh, you're watching the Old Gazer channel, uh, which is uh, uh, intended for beginning or inexperienced amateur astronomers, and the goal of which is to give you some practical information, some advice, some encouragement, just some general information uh, that's intended for beginners uh, uh, in the hope that it can help you find your way along as you move into this very wonderful hobby. So that's what we're all about. Welcome, and uh, we'll start with uh, this video. Uh, I'm doing a series of videos uh, on taking pictures through a telescope using a DSLR camera. Now, uh, the first video was about why you might want to consider learning how to do this and uh, demonstrating how to attach your camera to the telescope using a T-adapter and a T-ring. In the second video, we talked about some important settings on the DLSR with respect to taking pictures through a telescope, and we talked about the fact that you're gonna need to, to run your camera in manual mode, uh, you're probably going to have to choose a, a relatively high ISO or ISO setting uh, when taking uh, pictures of deep sky objects in order to uh, to get as much brightness as you possibly can because these are very dim objects. Uh, and we talked about uh, using uh, your uh, uh, live view screen on the back of the camera to monitor everything and to control everything. And we talked about things like using a, a remote shutter release cable so that you can take pictures without having to have your hands on the teles uh, telescope or the camera which would introduce some kind of movement or vibration or whatever uh, uh, as the picture's being taken. So uh, that's what we did in that video. Then in the, uh, in the third video, which we did last, we talked about how to estimate uh, exposure times for different kinds of mounts. And we discussed the fact that if you've got a purely manual mount, you'll only be able to take pictures with a, a, an exposure time of one or two seconds in most cases. If you've got an alt azimuth uh, computerized tracking mount, you can probably consistently take 10 or 15 second exposures, if not more. And then we talked about how with a, 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 a go-to computerized uh, equatorial tracking mount, you can get much longer exposures. And, uh, and so we talked about all of that and the ramifications of using each type of mount and what type of exposure times you might reasonably expect to get with those kinds of mounts. Now, uh, at the end of that video, I left you thinking that this fourth video uh, was going to be the last in the series and that it was going to uh, be all about doing a tutorial about something called image stacking or image integration, which involves taking a whole bunch of photographs of an object in the sky uh, and then merging those photographs together or stacking those photographs together uh, into a stacked uh, image, which uh, is going to be of much higher quality than any of the individual images would have been. Uh, we were going to do a tutorial about how to do that, but you may be dismayed and saddened to know that we're not going to do that in this video. <laughs> uh, uh, I have decided to put that off until the next video, which means this is going to uh, uh, wind up being not a four-part series, but a five-part series. But I promise you there will be a stacking tutorial in the next video to come. So what changed my mind? What caused me to delay that a little bit? Well, I've been getting some input from some viewers, who uh, some of whom are requesting or suggesting that I do a video in which I sort of uh, uh, show what my process is when I go out for a viewing session uh, to view or, uh, or image objects uh, out in the field. Uh, what do I do? How do I set everything up? What decision-making process do I go through to determine uh, telescope and camera settings? How do you actually go about uh, taking the photographs and so forth? And uh, to me, it seemed to make sense to include that at this point uh, so that you will know how I actually captured the photographs that we'll be using in the next video uh, in the uh, image stacking uh, tutorial. So uh, that's what I am going to do. I'm gonna take you right through step-by-step step, uh, uh, that whole process, the process that I go through when I'm going out for an evening of viewing uh, or imaging objects in the night sky. Now, 
those who suggested this or requested this, I'm pretty sure what they had in mind was that they wanted me to go out there and do this video right out there in the field at night while I'm actually doing this. Uh, and uh, I tried to, to see how that might work. And I took a, a couple of five or 10 minute videos uh, when I was out there. Uh, and to say that that didn't turn out well would be an understatement of major proportions. In fact, it turned out to be a raging disaster. <laughs> it's not something that I would want to inflict upon you. Uh, so uh, I'm not going to be doing that. And here's the primary reasons why. Uh, I don't have the equipment really uh, to do that. Uh, my videos uh, are all taken purely by using the my cell phone uh, for both video and audio. And that just doesn't work very well when you're out there in the field at night trying to maneuver around your telescope and explain things and, you know, in the dark and all of that. I just wasn't able to, to get that figured out. And uh, so that just, uh, you know, uh, just didn't work. Uh, the second reason is that maybe it's a function of age <laughs> in my case, but I had difficulty in trying to be about the business of setting my telescope up and, and viewing and, and photographing and all that while at the same time giving proper attention to make sure that I was doing a decent video. And it, you know, those, that was like two ships crossing in the night. Those are, were mutually exclusive events, you might say. It just didn't work. So uh, for the foreseeable future, you will not see me uh, uh, doing any videos actually out in the field at night when I'm actually viewing or imaging objects because I've tried that a little bit and believe me, you would not want to watch that. <laughs> and so I'm gonna spare you that. So I'm gonna take you through this process right here from the comfort of this chair in my own home. And I hope you will indulge me and, uh, <laughs> and realize that I did try uh, uh, make an attempt to see how it would work to do uh, one of these videos out in the field and it just didn't work. You'll have to take my word for it. So we're gonna do it from right here. Uh, now, let me tell you what I have in mind for this. Uh, uh, I went out on Thursday evening, uh, February 10th, uh, to uh, take some pictures of the uh, Orion Nebula. And the, uh, the objective here was to, to gather some pictures that we could use uh, uh, in the uh, uh, image stacking tutorial that I'm going to do next week. I'm going to show you how I went about uh, getting the pictures that we're going to use in that tutorial. And I'm just going to go through the whole process from beginning to end. Some of you will not be at all interested in this, and you can just turn this off and go do something better. <laughs> For some of you, uh, there might be something in here that will interest you or possibly even be of value to you. Uh, so, uh, you know, with that in mind, I'm going to forge ahead <laughs> with this video. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, start right out and tell you uh, the process that I go through when I go out for an evening of viewing or, uh, or imaging. Uh, I am not able to do my viewing or imaging. I'm not able to practice my hobby here at my own home. And that's because my property is completely surrounded by very tall trees and you just can't see the night sky from where I live. <laughs> It's just not possible. So that requires, of course, that I go offsite and go to a remote viewing area where I can actually see the sky. Uh, fortunately, I do have a, a place that's about a mile or so from my home, a big open field that lies at the top of a small ridge with a good view in all directions. Uh, I've got permission to be there and, uh, and it's a very good situation. I can go there anytime I want, stay as long as I want. And that's where I do the vast majority of my viewing, uh, and that's where I go out at night to practice my hobby. Now, uh, that's a good arrangement. However, it does require me to pack my equipment in the car, take it out there to that field, to take it out of the car, and set it all up and proceed from there. So that's a complication that m those of you who are able to uh, to operate from your backyard or your driveway or your apartment balcony or something like that, uh, uh, you don't have to deal with that. And it's not that big a deal, but uh, it's just a little something extra that I have to deal with each time. And it takes a little planning. I have to make sure when I get out there that I've got the stuff I need <laughs> so that I don't have to make a trip back, uh, you know, and that kind of thing. So, uh, so the first step is to take the equipment I need and carefully load it into my car to transport it out to the viewing area. 
uh, which brings me to the point of uh, telling you what equipment that I decided to take with me uh, on that, uh, uh, that Thursday night when I went out to take these pictures of the Orion Nebula. And so let me just kind of go through that list for you and tell you a little bit about why I selected the equipment that I did for that objective that night. Uh, I decided that I'm gonna use my Orion uh, CT80 uh, refracting telescope. It's got a good field of view. It's an F5 scope. Does a good job of collecting a lot of light per unit of time. Easy to, to uh, uh, maneuver, uh, lightweight, all of those things. Many advantages to it. Uh, my mount is this uh, Celestron uh, uh, Alt Azimuth Go-To Mount. Uh, now, this is the only mount that I use these days. In fact, I only use two telescopes these days, exclusively. I have an 8-inch schmidt cassegrainian telescope uh, that I use sometimes, and I have this 80-millimeter uh, refracting telescope that I use, and I just don't use any other telescopes. I have others, but I don't use them anymore. Those are the two I use. And this is the only mount that I use. I use this mount exclusively, just interchange the, uh, the telescope tubes uh, on this mount, uh, you know, at my discretion as I, as I like. And I use this mount. Now, I don't want to make this video too long, but let me stop right here and just make a point, if I might. Uh, this is an alt azimuth uh, 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 go-to mount. It, ha it is computerized, uh, it, it has motors and gears in it, which can find objects for you in the night sky and then track those objects as they appear to move across the sky. Uh, and you, you, you might think I'm being disingenuous here because in all of my previous videos, I have suggested that uh, beginning amateur astronomers uh, should start out with a purely manual mount uh, and, and such as a Dobsonian mount, perhaps, with a good six or eight inch Dobsonian, ref, uh, or pardon me, a reflect, Newtonian reflecting telescope. Uh, and the, and I, I think that's a good idea because that's the best telescope to learn the fundamentals with. Uh, you, you learn how to find things in the night sky and how to get your telescope pointed at them. You learn how to operate the telescope. Uh, a, a telescope with a manual mount is just a good way to learn the fundamentals uh, of the hobby. And that, uh, for that reason, I think that's what amateurs or, or beginning amateurs should start with. But I am anything but a beginner now. You, know, you may know from <laughs> my first couple of videos, I've been at this now for six decades. <laughs> and uh, I've had, for most of that time, I've used nothing but manual mounts. And so I know how to use a manual mount I know how to use a telescope. Uh, I know uh, how to find objects in the night sky and how to get my telescope pointed at them. I'm past that point. <laughs> I know the fundamentals fairly well. <laughs> and so now I allow myself the luxury of using one of these uh, computerized go-to mounts. Uh, it's kind of like a reward for all those years of learning that have preceded this time. I actually haven't been using this all that long. Uh, but uh, I do use it exclusively and I enjoy it very much. I really don't need it so much to help me find objects in the sky uh, after all the, the years that I've been trying to do that. Uh, my main uh, 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 reason for liking and using this mount is because the tracking capability, the ability of that, uh, this mount to track objects as they appear to move across the sky, allows me to take longer exposure photographs than a manual mount would allow me to do. You know, a manual mount will allow you to take one or two second exposures. This alt azimuth uh, go-to mount will uh, let me take consistently 10 to 15 second exposures and sometimes more than that. So uh, that's why I like this mount. It's been a very good mount. Uh, if you get it properly aligned, it does a very good job of finding and tracking objects and I have enjoyed using it very much. And it, uh, if you have a manual mount, don't have anything like this yet, what I'm about to go through here tonight with this discussion uh, will pertain to you also. You'll just have fewer steps and it'll be a less complicated process. Uh, you may have a, 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 an equatorial uh, go-to mount, uh, which for purposes of taking objects in the night sky is far superior to this one because it, it gives you the capability of taking much longer exposures. And you may already have one of those or you may be headed towards getting one of those in the future. Uh, I think about it often. Uh, I've 
got some experience, quite a bit of experience at using equatorial mounts. And I just happen to like this one better. It just seems more intuitive to me. It's a little bit easier to use. I don't have to worry about uh, precise polar alignment and those kind of things. So uh, this, is, uh, this one works for me very well. But the kind of things that I'm gonna discuss in this video will be applicable no matter what kind of mount you have. They'll just be a little less or more complicated than what I'm gonna describe here today. So that's why I wanted to explain why I use a, a computerized go-to mount. Uh, I think I have uh, gone far enough with this hobby that I uh, can afford the luxury of doing that and I enjoy using it very much. And of course, you have a very sturdy tripod down here that I took out with me, uh, which performs a stable base upon which to, to mount the mount uh, and the telescope. Okay, so what else did I take with me out there that night? Well, uh, this is a powered mount, of course. It requires power. And so I have an external 12 volt power supply that I took out with me uh, to uh, provide power to the mount. Uh, I, of course, took my trusty DSLR. Now, what good would it be to go out and try to take a bunch of pictures of the Orion Nebula only to get out there and find out that you forgot your camera? Wouldn't be too surprising. You know, I've had lots of senior moments like that, but I did remember to take my camera on this occasion. Uh, I had a, one uh, uh, optional piece of equipment that I took uh, along with the camera, and that is this remote shutter release cable. And you will need something like this if you're gonna take pictures of objects in the night sky so that you can take your pictures remotely without having to touch either your camera or your telescope and thereby induce some type of vibration or movement or anything in there that would ruin your image. So uh, I took that along. Uh, I took along this little Batonov mask which fits over the end of the telescope here and which helps you to achieve a good sharp focus. Uh, and I would invite you to go back and watch the video I did on how to achieve a good sharp focus. And that explains all about how this works and why it's a, a, a to, a advantageous to use one of these. I also took along with me this uh, eyepiece, which I have mounted in the star diagonal here. Uh, this is a 20 millimeter eyepiece that has an illuminated reticle or crosshairs in it. And uh, the reason for that, the reason I took that out with me is going to become apparent as I go further through this video. So I did take that along and I took this little level along because uh, you'll, you'll uh, find out soon that one of the things that's very, very important when you're using a go-to mount like this is that the tripod uh, and the equipment that's uh, mounted to the tripod needs to be level, as perfectly level as you can possibly manage because the method that these, uh, that these mounts use to go about developing their models of the night sky that enables them to find and track things uh, assumes that your, uh, your system is going to be perfectly level to begin with. And so I try to make sure that uh, everything stays, that the bubble stays within the lines there while I'm setting things up in the field. So uh, that's what I took with me uh, out into the field. And I very carefully packed all of this equipment into my car and off I went. Uh, and uh, very shortly I was at that viewing site and I pulled into the edge of that field and got out and just kind of uh, 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 looked at things a little bit uh, to see uh, what the seeing conditions were going to be and you know, what the uh, overall feel of the night was and that kind of thing. And that's when I realized that I had picked a, uh, actually a poor night for trying to take photographs of a deep sky object. Uh, I, I live in an area where in a border five slash six zone, uh, which means there's quite a bit of light pollution here where I live. Now, those of you who are in cities in border eight or nine zones will laugh at that and, and say well, he should consider himself lucky. And I realize that. But the border five and six has still got significant light uh, pollution going on, especially to the south and east of where I view, because there's a big metropolitan area in that direction, and there's always a dome of sky glow from light pollution when I'm looking in that direction. But it was even worse on this particular night because there was a 68% waxing gibbous moon sitting pretty much right overhead in the sky there that night, and that happened to be close to the Orion constellation, 
And so there was a lot of moon glow uh, that was being produced by the moon being out that night. And that combination of moon glow and the sky glow had really brightened the skies up. And that's not a good scenario for trying to take pictures of deep sky objects. However, two things to consider here. Number one, you have to take your clear skies when you get them. <laughs> I'd had a run of, a long run of cloudy skies and I was eager and, and, and needed to get out there under those clear skies and do something. And so I wasn't going to be deterred. But even more significantly, the Orion Nebula happens to be, you know, perhaps the brightest of the deep sky objects. Uh, and, uh, and so you can photograph it even with considerable uh, brightening of the background sky by sky glow and moon glow and that kind of thing. So I had a pretty good feeling that I would be able to get some decent images uh, of M42, the Orion Nebula, despite the bright sky conditions that existed out there that night. I also noticed it was very cold, <laughs> but uh, it was very beautiful, a very clear night, and, uh, and I was eager to get started. So I took the equipment out of the car and walked it out to the, 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 very, the site where I was going to do my viewing, which not surprisingly was pretty much in the center of the field, <laughs> which seems like it would probably be the best place to be. Uh, took the tripod out first and set it up and used the level to make sure that it was level and I had to make some adjustments uh, with the, uh, the legs uh, to adjust the tripod a little bit and then I was satisfied finally that I had leveled it very, very well. Then I took the mount out and I uh, mounted it to the tripod and fastened it very securely in place and then of course I took the telescope out and mounted it, uh, attached it to the mount. Now. Uh, this telescope has a, a little uh, plate on the bottom, which is called a dovetail plate, and the mount has a, a dovetail saddle in it. And uh, the, the plate fits into the saddle, and you lock that down real tightly, and it snugly secures uh, your optical tube to the mount, gives you a very stable, very secure uh, connection there. So I set that all up, uh, uh, you know, tripod, mount, telescope, uh, and now I'm ready for the next step. So what is the next step? Well, when you're all set up and ready to go, uh, you have to, uh, in the case of, of a go-to mount, a computerized mount, before you can use it, uh, you have to, uh, to feed information into the mount to allow it to develop a model of the night sky so that it will know how to find things and know how to track things. And so you have to align the, the mount. The, and let me tell you what the steps are, are uh, that are involved in aligning a mount such as this one. They'll be different for a, uh, uh, an equatorial uh, mount. And of course, you don't have to worry about any alignment if you've got a manual mount. You just point it at the sky and there you are. But you do have to align this mount. And here's the way you go about it. Uh, when, you, when you tell it that you're ready to align, and it then proceeds to ask you for a few pieces of information. Uh, and it starts off by asking you where you are. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it needs to know where you are. And that means it wants to know the coordinates of where you're viewing from. Now, there are two ways to do that. Uh, the, uh, uh, the database uh, within this mount uh, contains a list of cities and you can find the city that you are closest to uh, when you're doing your viewing and simply select that city and that will put in the coordinates for that city and that uh, in many cases will be good enough to, to uh, sort of identify where you are. Or you can put in specific latitude and longitude coordinates, which I always do, uh, because that gives you a more precise fix on where you are and will enable the telescope to do a better job of tracking and, and finding objects then. So uh, I always put in my specific latitude and longitude at that point so that now the telescope knows where I am, or pardon me, the, the mount knows where I am and where I'm going to be viewing from. The next thing it's going to ask you for is the time. Uh, and, uh, and you're going to put in the time in hours, minutes, and seconds, and the more precisely you can do that, uh, the, uh, the better your alignment is going to be, and therefore the more precise your, your uh, uh, finding and tracking of objects is going to be. 
then it's going to ask you to uh, whether or not uh, you're you're in a, a situation of standard time or daylight savings time. And so you'll put in the appropriate uh, input there using this hand controller, by the way. That's how you input all this information in here. Uh, after it's asked you for the time, it's going to ask you for the date. And you'll simply put in uh, today's date. Uh, uh, now, you can uh, 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 get uh, uh, an optional accessory for this mount, uh, a, GP, a GPS module. Uh, which plugs in here and which will automatically uh, uh, place all of that information within the system for you. <clears throat> I have not elected to do that because it costs, a, I don't know, if memory serves, 150 US dollars or so. And it really, you know, this, this sounds more complicated than it is. It doesn't take that long to input this information into the mount using this hand controller here. And that's the way that I've gone and that's worked well for me. So I don't see any reason for me to go out and drop some coin for a, a GPS uh, uh, module. So, but you, there it is available if you so choose to do that. So now we have told the telescope uh, uh, where we are and when we are, if you will. Uh, it knows our location, it knows the time, it knows the date, and it's ready to start finding and tracking objects. Uh, uh, but first you have to align it with a couple of stars in the sky. Uh, there are, are different ways to align the telescope from this point. The option I always use is called auto two star alignment, which requires me to get two different stars within the field of view of the telescope, right in the center of the field of view, and uh, let the mount know that I have aligned that star. And when the alignment of those two stars is finished, then you are uh, aligned and ready to go. Uh, you choose the first star yourself, and that means you've got to know a little bit about what, what, what some of the stars are and where you can find them in the sky. Uh, I chose Rigel, uh, which is a, a, a fairly bright star in the Orion constellation. And using my viewfinder and by just uh, moving the telescope around, uh, I was able to get Rigel within the field of view of the telescope. And then that's where this little device comes in. Uh, with this eyepiece, with the reticle, uh, illuminated reticle in it, uh, you, you can see exactly where the center of your field of view is. It's, it's where those two cross uh, hairs cross, of course. And you can uh, get uh, that uh, uh, alignment star, in this case, Rigel, right in the center of the eyepiece. You don't have to guess at it. And that's going to give you a more precise alignment, enable your mount to do a better job of finding and tracking objects. So I got Rigel in the center of the crosshairs there. And then using this hand controller, told the telescope, okay, Rigel is now aligned. The telescope then uh, said that it was going to move to uh, uh, the star Sirius and use that as the second alignment star. It made that decision, uh, not me, which is always good. If somebody else makes a decision for me, that's a win. <laughs> Trust me. But... Uh, <coughs> uh, you can override that and choose another if you like, but uh, I had no need to do that. Sirius is one of the brightest stars in the sky. It's close to the uh, Orion uh, constellation. And so I said, okay, fine, use uh, Sirius as a second alignment star. So it, uh, it, it slew, uh, the telescope went to, all on its own, uh, to uh, where Sirius is in the sky. And I looked at the eyepiece and sure enough, there was Sirius sitting within the field of view uh, of the eyepiece. I then uh, used this illuminated reticle again to make sure I got Sirius perfectly aligned uh, in the middle of the field of view. And I told uh, the mount, okay, uh, Sirius is now aligned. And uh, I got a message back immediately saying, uh, alignment successful. And so that's a, that's a happy moment. <laughs> And uh, at that point, you're ready to go. The telescope, the mount, pardon me, is now able to find objects in the sky and to track them across the sky now that the process of alignment is complete. I, I hope that's not too complicated or, or it, it, you know, is, is uh, uh, a little too much for this video, but you may someday have a mount like this. Uh, you might just be interested to know uh, how you use it. And that's how you go about aligning an alt-azimuth go-to mount. 
Uh, and so enough said about that. Now, at this point, I'm sitting with the telescope pointed at the star Sirius, the dog star, which is one of the brightest stars in the sky. And so it occurs to me that this is a good place to, uh, to get uh, good focus. Because, uh, you know, you're, if you saw my video on how to get good sharp focus, you will remember that it's important to get good focus on a bright star, uh, something that you're going to be able to see through your camera. So I decided that before I move the telescope anywhere else, I'm going to keep it on Sirius, and I'm going to obtain good focus on Sirius before I move on. So, at that point, I removed uh, the eyepiece with the uh, illuminated reticle, and I put in its place my DSLR camera. And by the way, I already have the T adapter and the T ring uh, attached to the camera here just to move this thing along a little bit. So we will attach the camera to the telescope. And there we go. Uh, we're now ready to, uh, to look through the camera to see what uh, the telescope is seeing. We will turn the camera on. We'll turn live view on. And we should at this point be able to look at this live view screen on the back of the camera here and see Sirius somewhere within that live view screen back there. Uh, so the, the first step in the process is to focus it as well as you can simply by using the focusing knobs on the telescope. And then once you've got that as best you can get it, uh, you can use a button knob mask like this, which... Uh, attaches to the front of the telescope that way. When the light from Sirius comes through there, that sets up a diffraction pattern, and you can use that, that diffraction pattern to further uh, 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 gain further precision with your focus and get it as sharp as you can possibly get it. So that's what I did. And uh, so uh, using that method, I got a good focus on the star Sirius. And once you get focus on uh, one star, all other stars should now be in focus and the deep sky objects should be in focus as well. I mean, you may have to, you know, uh, check on that from time to time during the evening, but, uh, but that's the way you, you get good focus, by finding something bright that you can see well on the live view screen back here and focusing on it and then you're just, okay. We're pointed at Sirius. We have the camera on the telescope and we are well focused on Sirius. Now it's time to move to the Orion Nebula and get ready to take some photographs. So uh, uh, you just simply, using this hand controller again, uh, tell the telescope that you want to go to M42, which is the Messier designation for the Orion Nebula, and the telescope, all on its own, will slew to the position where it is calculated that the Orion Nebula is supposed to be in the sky. So I did that and I looked uh, at the live view screen back here and lo and behold, I'll pat myself on the back here. I had done a really good job of aligning the telescope because there was the Orion Nebula pretty much right in the center of the field of view. Uh, now, it doesn't always turn out that way, uh, uh, let me tell you. <laughs> there was a lot of luck involved in that as well, but I had a really good alignment on this particular night. And now I have the, the object that I'm looking for, the Orion Nebula, right in the center of the field of view, and I'm ready to start taking photographs. Now, the, the only decisions to be made next were, number one, uh, what ISO or ISO setting am I going to choose? Now, I've told you in previous videos that I normally use an ISO setting of 3200 when I'm uh, uh, trying to photograph deep sky objects because I need, with the equipment that I've got, I usually need that extra amount of brightness that a high ISO setting will provide. And my camera only goes to uh, ISO 3200. It goes beyond that with some simulated settings, but you never want to use those if you can avoid it. So I normally use 3200, but I decided to go against that, uh, uh, that tendency uh, in this case for two reasons. Number one, the background was very light, and I knew I was going to have a hard time when I edited these photos and trying to get some of that light pollution out of the picture, uh, and so I, I wanted it to be a little bit darker. And the second reason is that the Orion Nebula can be a little bit difficult to expose. It's very easy to find. It's very bright. It's one of the first things usually that people who are interested in deep sky objects will look at and try to photograph. But it has a very bright core, 
uh, where there are some very bright stars. There's a group of stars within that core known as the trapezium. And then you move out to the outer edges of the nebula and you've got this very faint nebulosity out there. So you've got a big range of uh, brightness uh, in, in the image. You've got to try to, if you possibly can, maintain some level of detail in that bright core while exposing long enough to pick up the detail in the dark, uh, uh, dim uh, fringes of the nebula out there as well. So. Uh, I decided that uh, a, a lower ISO would probably serve me well in that uh, situation by a little bit, just so I wouldn't completely blow out, uh, you know, the core of the nebula and make that overwhelm everything else in the photographs. So, long story short, I, I mean, uh, I mean, it has been a long story, but, but to get to the end of the matter, I, ha I decided that I would use an uh, ISO setting of 1600 uh, for this particular exercise. So I set my ISO on the camera to 1600. Next decision, uh, how long is my exposure time going to be? Well, uh, this being an alt azimuth mount, uh, you may remember if you watched the previous video that I've determined over the years that I can usually count on getting about 10 to 15 seconds of exposure using an alt azimuth tracking mount before uh, star trails or blurring of the image starts to become a problem. However, sometimes you can go beyond that. And I thought, well, uh, the, the, I had, the alignment looks pretty good tonight. Uh, maybe I'll be able to, uh, maybe it's tracking really well. Maybe I'll be able to get a little bit more than 10 to 15 seconds. So I took some test pictures. Uh, and I started out by taking a, a 30 second exposure. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, that 30 second exposure came back showing some star trails. So I knew I wasn't going to be able to get away with that. So I just dropped back in five second increments. I took a picture at 25 seconds, at 20, at 15, and then at 10. And I could have gotten away with using a, 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 an exposure time of 20 seconds. I mean, the image looked good enough at a 20 second exposure time that I probably could have used that. but. I wanted things to look good and sharp uh, for this exercise and for this tutorial coming up. So I just made a decision that I was going to use 10 second exposures. No star trailing and no blurring of the image, uh, just a nice uh, uh, image that way. So I made the decision to take 10 second exposures at ISO 1600. Next question then is how many pictures uh, was I going to decide to take? Uh, you know, the idea of this whole uh, image integration uh, process or image stacking process is that you take a bunch of pictures, one right after the other, and then you, uh, on your computer, you stack those pictures together into one composite image, uh, which has the best of all of those individual images and throws away some of the worst of those individual images so that you wind up with a stacked uh, a photograph that is much better than any of the individual images are. Uh, so uh, the more you take, the better. Uh, the more pictures that you put in the stack, the less noise you're going to have and the more detail you're going to see. So the more, the better. So I, but I decided that for this exercise that I was going to uh, shoot for a total integration time of 30 minutes. I was going to take pictures of the Orion Nebula for 30 minutes. One one 10 second exposure right after the other until I had taken 10 minutes worth of photos of, uh, of the Orion Nebula. Now, that meant of course that if I'm shooting 10 second exposures, that's six per minute, uh, six times 30, uh, I was uh, planning to take 180 10 second exposures of the Orion Nebula. Uh, so, that's where this comes in. Uh, the first thing I did was uh, with the camera set at an exposure time of 10 seconds and an ISO of 1600, I took another test picture. And I looked at that very carefully on the live view screen to make sure that things were in focus, uh, that nothing had drifted very far from the center of the field of view, uh, and uh, uh, that there was no star trailing or uh, blurring of the image. And I satisfied myself by looking at that test photograph that everything looked good and I was ready to go. And that's where the fun part began. I simply pressed this remote shutter button uh, and it has a locking feature on it, which you might want to seriously consider making sure your remote shutter cable has. I pressed the button and locked it down 
and my trusty camera immediately began to take 10 second exposures of the Orion Nebula, one after the other, after the other, after the other. And uh, I knew it would continue to do that until I came back and stopped the process. So I had a choice to make at this point. Uh, I could either stand there in the cold for 30 minutes and wait for this uh, camera to take 180 pictures of the Orion Nebula over a period of 30 minutes, or I could go sit in my car uh, and just let the camera do its thing. Well, I'm, I'm old, but I'm not stupid, at least not all the time, although my wife might have something to say about that. Uh, I went and got in my car, and I turned the, uh, the, the seat warmer on. And I sat there and I set the, the timer on my smartphone for 30 minutes and uh, I proceeded to play hearts against three very worthy virtual opponents <laughs> while that camera sat out there in the cold and did its thing, clicking picture after picture after picture. <laughs> you know, and that's one thing that you've got the luxury of doing if you're, if you're uh, uh, stacking pictures, taking multiple pictures, and you can somehow can lock your camera so that it continues to do that until you say otherwise. You can walk away and do something else, uh, and uh, that's a, a very good option to have. Uh, I did go out uh, twice during that 30-minute interval and uh, stopped the process and looked at the last picture that had been taken just to make sure that everything still looked in focus, uh, that nothing had drifted too far from the center of the field of view and so forth, and I saw no problem, so I just started the process again, went back to my car and played some more hearts. 30 minutes ended, the timer went off on my uh, smartphone, and I said, voila. I've got 30 minutes of integration time. I've just taken 180 pictures of the Orion Nebula. Uh, it's time to stop this and uh, take everything down and, uh, and go home. So I got out, but you know, uh, again, maybe age is a factor here, but I find that I am pretty easily distracted. So when I got out of the car, I started looking around. Despite the moon glow and the sky glow that was prevalent that night, the sky was still very beautiful. I mean, you could see the brightest stars and so forth. And <clears throat> of course the moon was up there, very beautiful as it always is. And I was just in so much enjoying looking at all of that and enjoying that nice, crisp, beautiful night. What a beautiful night to be out there. Most clear nights are, and this one was no exception. It was just a beautiful time to be out there. So I kind of got distracted by just, I get caught up in the moment of what I'm doing and how much I'm enjoying it and how wonderful it is. And uh, make a long story short, I wound up actually uh, taking 35 minutes of integration time rather than 30 <laughs> before I got everything to, uh, turned off. So I wound up with 210 exposures rather than the 180 that I had planned on in the beginning. So the pictures were now taken and uh, it was just a matter now of turning everything off disassembling everything, packing it very carefully in the car, and going home, which I did. Uh, the only other thing I did that evening was I, I did transfer the pictures from the camera to my computer so that I would be ready to go uh, and ready to start uh, the next video, which is going to be a tutorial on what to do with those uh, 210 pictures now that they've been taken in terms of combining or merging them together into a stacked image that will be much better than any of the individual images uh, on their own. So that sets us up for the final video. And I promise you in the last video, number five, coming up next, there will be a tutorial in which we will take these uh, 210 images uh, that we uh, uh, exposed and we will bring them into a stacking program and we'll get a, a look at what this stacking or image integration process is all about. So uh, that's for next time. Uh, I, I hope this hasn't been too boring. Uh, I hope it's been relevant. Uh, to some of you, it probably hasn't been. Maybe to, uh, to others of you, uh, you might have uh, been interested in this, might have learned a little bit. I certainly hope so. Uh, and uh, it was fun doing it. And uh, but uh, I'm going to uh, wrap this one up right there uh, and uh, not keep you any longer. Thank you so very much for watching the video. And uh, as always, I'll sign off here by wishing you clear skies and good view.